So today I believe that as we prepare our hearts that God's going to help us to break through and smash every stronghold. Father, we just come before you today right now and Lord, we ask you by your spirit that you'd come and help us open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Father, as, as we come into your presence in a special way right now to hear your word, and Lord, Lord, I pray that your, your word would just carry that anointing that would speak to us and help us to break anything that the enemy has put over our lives and, and that we would be free uh, to be everything that you want us to be. And for that, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. Last week, we were speaking about the, uh, uh, the Goliaths and the giants and things like that in our lives. And we said quite a lot last week, really. And I went home from church on Sunday, uh, just that song, uh, In My Father's Arms, and I Will Rise Above. And of course, the message to a, a young David as he, as he rose above the challenge that was in front of him. And, and I was just so, so, I don't know, just touched by God. It just lingered on me for so long that God wants every one of us to rise above, not to carry the shame and the pain and and everything like that that we carry many times, and he wants us to overcome and to rule and to reign. And I've just uh, written a couple of things down that I spoke before. If you don't fight your giants and, sub and subdue them, then you will serve them. A lot of people, people serve fear and they serve anger and addictions. All these things are designed by Satan to kill the giftings in your life. And I want to just continue a little bit more in Samuel. And I'd like for you to open up your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Samuel. And an uh, amazing book, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We know the story only too well, but I just want to just go over a few things again. It says, then he stood, and this is, this is the Goliath, verse 8 of chapter 17, and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you a servant of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And the interesting thing here, you see, these people, though they were God's people, they didn't really serve God. They were serving Saul. They were serving the world system. They were serving something there that God never ever intended them to serve. Something happened in 1 Samuel uh, 8, verse 4, that I believe changed the atmosphere around Israel. It changed the atmosphere, and Satan has been using this tactic ever since. It says, choose me a man to reign over us rather than God. I just want to read this to you if I can. It's in 1 Samuel uh, verse, uh, chapter 8. And we all know these stories, but I just want it's good to, to remember them again. Uh, and uh, reading from verse 4. And all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Raham and, and said to them, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in, the, in God's ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all other nations. You know, Samuel was displeased at this and, and, and he started to inquire about to God and he started to say to God, what's going on here? And, and God spoke to him very, very plainly and he, and he said, listen, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Don't take this personally. This is a ploy of the enemy to take people out of my covering, out of my, from the mantle that I want to put over them. I want to, and, and it's a way that the world system is going to infiltrate the church. There's an enemy out there that wants to get into the church, that wants to get the minds of people that they'll serve another God. But, but, but God said to Samuel, but I want you, and I want you to warn them of the consequences of their decision. You see, today, every one of us, we are, we are adults, we are mature, but we have choices. And there are a lot of people today, they, they, won't, they may not want to really serve God. They may not really want to 
to really totally commit themselves to God. Perhaps they, they want to just live in the world and, and come along to church as an as a insurance policy just to get to heaven. But God says to him and said, listen, I want you to know that this is very, very serious what's going on here. These people are rejecting me and they want to have a natural king. They want to be like the rest of the world. Friend, if you want to be a Christian but still have all the world, it's dangerous. And he said, I want you to know the consequences. I want you to know what's going to happen because of your decision. We know then we come there, but at that particular time, something happened in the atmosphere around the church. The church started to go into decline. The king that they had really wasn't a godly king. He represented God, but he really wasn't a godly king. He really, God really wasn't the, the major part of his life. The difference between Saul and David was David had a relationship with God. Something very, very different. And in 1 Samuel 17 verse 11, it says, And when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I just, I guess today, if we can understand that God wants not just to have a bunch of people that have a Sunday morning relationship with God. They want some, he, he wants a bunch of people who become his kids, who have an everyday relationship with him. And I'm, I'm not talking about that you've got to get on your face or you've got to get on your knees or, you, or you've got to read your uh, 20 pages of, uh, uh, or 20 chapters of your Bible every day and you've got to fast for so many 40 days. I'm talking about having a natural relationship with a real, real God who wants to be my father. That driving in the car, washing the dishes, whatever you're doing, somehow in your heart, you, there's, a, there's a something from the inside of you that just reaches out and says, Jesus, I love you. Father, I love you. And, and it's not something that you put on. It's not something that you wear over you. It's something that comes from within. It's your heart response to a God. Sure, there will be times when you'll sit down and you'll read your Bible all day perhaps. There's times when you'll sit set aside and you'll fast. There's times when you'll pray and get on your face and get on your knees and do whatever. But I'm just saying it's not a ritual. It's not a recipe. It's a relationship. And we come and just say, Father, I love you. I honor you. I worship you. And, 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 and as you say that, your, your emotions and, your, and even your eyes can well up with tears and because you just, there's, there's that, and it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street. We've heard this morning of communion and that, that God's saying, I love you, I love you, I'm doing it for you, I'm doing it for you. He's told us that many times. But it's us now responding to that love. It's our, us responding and just telling him how much we love him. So when the Goliath came and challenged, instead of them having that relationship with God and knowing what God wants for them, God will never ever leave me nor forsake me. God wants to fight for me. God is on my side. Instead of saying, hey, it doesn't matter how big you are, it doesn't matter how, how hard you're, what, how much you're shouting at us, my God is sufficient. But instead of that, they became dismayed and they were full of fear. And you see, with the church today, there's somehow or other that we've got to come back. We have drifted so far away. The church has got to come back to that relationship with God when we know that no weapon formed against us can prosper. Every tongue that rises against us in judgment, we can condemn them. But know this, that man, mankind came and said, we don't want God. 
We want a man. Friend, don't ever serve a man. Serve God. Choose a man. They chose a man to reign, o- reign over them rather than God. They actually rejected God. They took themselves out from underneath that covering and underneath the mantle. And they got warned. They was told what would happen. So now the enemy comes, but they've got no defense. They've got nothing there to fall back on because, because they've lost everything. They've drifted so far away from the reality of what God wanted from them. And they heard those words. But then in verse 12, it says now, and it talks about a David. And I want to tell you this, that God's still watching over his people. He still wants to answer his people. He still has an answer for us. If we just turn to him, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and call upon me. You see, here we find that there was a circumstance in a situation that the leaders of the, of the church or the leaders of the, of the nation had no answer. They're full of fear. They're, they're, they've got, they're dismayed. They're, goodness knows what else. But all of a sudden, the Bible says, now David, God's answer. God has always got an answer for the circumstance and the situation that we face. It may not seem right, it may not seem what we think, but God's got an answer. And I'm today believing this, that God's answer for the world today is the church. I was called once to speak at a political rally. They were all, it was a state uh, thing. Pauline Hansen and, and a few other uh, people were there. Uh, religious leaders, other national leaders, all these people were there. And they asked me to speak for 10 minutes. And we were listening to all the natural remedies to save Queensland. And I got up to, in my 10 minutes and I said, the first thing that you, re- you must realize all the natural things you put in place are not the answer. Because the battle that you're facing is not a natural battle. It's a spiritual battle. And until you realize it's a spiritual battle, the answers won't be the answer. You see, if the problem's not the problem, more money, more better roads, all that, yeah, they're all good things. But you see, if the problem's not the problem, then the answer is not the answer. Jesus is the answer. The church is the answer. One man sort of got up and rebuked me a little bit. I told this story before. He said, well, my Presbyterian minister used to say, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> Praise God. I don't know what he meant by that anyway. I believe that God's answer today is the church on fire, full of the Holy Ghost. That's the answer. Totally depending on God. These people were not depending on God. They were depending on their own ability to fight this Goliath. And of course, their whole thinking was now brought from out here into the realm of the Spirit and the magnitude of what God could do was all consumed right down here and right now and condensed into a brain. And so man's trying to think, how are we going to sort this out? But what can we do? I want to say this. Whatever God does, He can do again and again and again and again. Amen? I believe that we, the church, need to take off our grave clothes. We need to take off our beggar's robes. We need to put on new clothes. We need to put on this, a, 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 a spirit of joy, amen. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We need to clothe ourselves in God's righteousness and declare the goodness of God. God is either everything or is nothing. 
What was the difference between David and the armies of Israel? David had a relationship with his God. And his desire was to serve the Lord and to please God. Friend, if we can just start to turn our attention a little bit, instead of the world system that gets inside us, Israel served a man, a natural king. Israel, Israel wanted to be like other, all the other nations, the world. Today, sadly, we live in a time when the world, when the church rather, wants to be like the world. Without, I'm not criticizing because, friends, there are, an ama there are amazing things happening in the churches. I don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You're all right. thought it was God for a minute. <laughs> Tom was talking to me the other day. There's, there's a church. What's the name of the church? No, the one that you drove the bus for with the kids. Calvary Church. Calvary Church, 200 youth. Is that right? 200 youth. He drove to a, to a youth camp. They're doing an amazing job, amen. What an amazing job. Uh, there was another person I was talking to the other day. They said that youth are coming, coming by the droves, by the droves, by the droves. I, I'm just believing that the fire of God will burn in them, amen. But we are living in a time when, when a lot of the church today are, are wanting to be like the world. I remember I was uh, flicking through TV one, one day there and, and there was this bunch of people there. They had smoke machines and, and, and they were, hands were raised and there was all the people on the platform and they were dancing and shouting and, and I'm thinking, my God, this is Hillsong. And so I, I just watched for a while and it wasn't. It was a secular movement, a secular thing. We've got to be careful the enemy's a bad devil. Do you believe that? I love Hillsong. I love our police. I'm not being critical. But what I'm just saying is we've got to be careful that we don't become like the world. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. We drifted because of fleshly desires to become like the world. In short, In my short life, I've seen a lot of changes since I got saved. How many people have been saved for about 50 years? You know, when I first got saved, there was no sport on Sunday. No sport on Sunday. Hey? Who? No pubs. Gee, Jesus, how bad is that? The pub's open Sunday now. How do you know, Millie? <laughs> you go up for a quick snort now and then, do you? <laughs> but there was no sport on Sundays. There was no, uh, there was no shops open Sundays, and, to the, and today there's no material on swimsuits. <laughs> Christians didn't go to doctors. When I first got saved, tithing was just mandatory. You just expected it, but today we've got so many good doctrines, why well, you don't have to. Just give God a tip. But you see, in 1 Samuel 17, verse 17, God's still got his man, amen? And I believe that God's still got his church, and he's going to do something with his church. 
He's going to move mightily in His church. He's going to do amazing things in His church. Amen. 1 Samuel 17, verse 17 Uh, and Jesse said to his son, David, now take for your brothers uh, some raisins and some flour and some stuff like that and go off down into the battle. So here's David, doesn't really understand what's going on. He's just obeying orders. But God still has his man, and I believe that God is going to show himself strong. God's still got his Davids. God's still got his church that I believe that he's just going to breathe on again and again and again. And in verse 32, we find, and we'll go through all, you know all that, you can read that later yourself. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Friend, I want to tell you it's time for you and I, as the church, to stand up and start to fight the weaknesses in our flesh, the weaknesses that are around our lives. You see, David put out a decree and said to the man, he was looking for somebody, to the man who stands up and fights this Goliath, and kills him, prevails over him, I will give to him my daughter's hand in marriage. I will give them riches, and they'll be free from taxes. So today, if our doctrine is a prosperity doctrine, we will say David fought the Goliath for prosperity. But I believe that David's heart was not after the money. David said this, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? We can just think, well, all David did, and I've heard it preached many times that all he did, he went after the money, went after the girls, went after the glitter, and so it's okay. It's not, because I don't believe that that was on his heart. We only have that, that's all we believe. I believe David fought the, gli the giant because he was God's man for the hour. I believe that God's going to have a church that's going to be his answer. Today the church is God's answer. I believe that with every fiber of my being. When Saul offered wives, riches, and it's only carnal things, fleshly things, fleshly rewards. God's reward to David was far greater. Don't settle for the world's riches. Get God's best. Don't just settle for what the enemy wants us to do or what the world wants to give to us. God wants you to rule over the pull of the world and the flesh. Has anybody here else here ever felt the pull? Who knows what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a spiritual thing, but there's a pull that will pull you in that direction. That'll try to take you away. And there's a lot of ministry that started off in the spirit and ended off in the flesh. Because they went after the fleshly desires and they went after the fleshly things. There's things there that, that, that hinder the move of God. God wants us to rule over the pull of the world and the flesh. If you don't fight and kill the giant, you will serve them. But when you rise up in God and overcome the temptations, they will serve you. I believe in prosperity, friends. But prosperity is more than money. It's more than riches. You know, we live in a day, you just have to walk through the shopping centers. Children are putting demands on their parents. And parents are fearful if they don't bow, the children won't love them. 
The Bible says, children, obey your parents. Many children speak terrible to their parents. In reality, the children rule and they've lost respect for their parents. It's got to turn, hasn't it? It's got to turn. Running off to the this and that, so much sport. You know what? Nine out of ten kids that go to soccer never play after they find a mate of the opposite sex. All the ballerinas that go out and get the tutus and the stuff, nine out of ten of them would never, ever become a ballerina. I think. When the church, Israel rejected God from ruling over them and wanted a natural king to judge and rule over them, they slipped into the world system. Remember this, when the ship is in the water, it's okay. But when the water gets into the ship, you're in trouble. I, One of our, our, well, yesterday afternoon, this guy, Clement, contacted me. He's the uh, national chairman from Christian Outreach Center, become Inc., become I don't know what. And uh, he came to see me and started to talk to me about the things of the Spirit. Hmm? National chairman from Sylvania. Where did I say? Oh, from Sylvania. And he came and, and uh, this guy was a fellow that went to this big church, but the pastor was in a wheelchair. And he ran this mega church. And Clement was so, so excited and so full of the Holy Ghost that, that the, the pastor was introducing him as he was going to preach that day. And he reached over and grabbed this guy and pulled him out of the wheelchair and said, Walk! <laughs> and he started to shout, Walk in Jesus' name! Walk in Jesus' name! And, and he pulled him out of this thing. And the guy took three steps and the deacons and the elders of the church ran around with the wheelchair <laughs> and got in behind him and shoved him back in the wheelchair. That guy is still in the wheelchair. And I was talking to Clement because I remember the story only too well and he was laughing. He said, yeah, he said, he said but he walked three steps. Today, today, you see, we've got the saying now, one minute's embarrassment could save somebody from going to a lifeless eternity. And we've got to break through the, the, the you know, the, the shyness and goodness. Oh, put, man, the tenacity. Pulled him out. Walk in Jesus' name. Walk. In, and, he, and he took three steps before the elders could get the thing back under him. He said, you know, he said, that man, he said, he, he said, I'm still in good fellowship with that man. He said, he sends me $150 every month just to stay in contact. See, friends, there's the spirit side, there's the world side. There's the faith side. You know, but that guy today, he said, Neil, he said, in Sylvania, He, he has 20% of the national church attendance, that's Christian church, in his church. 20% of the whole nation is in his church. And that's 150 people. A whole nation. A whole nation. Amazing. Amazing man. But he says, Neil... He said, now, he said, I go to the radio stations and they've given me an SOS number. People who are in trouble, who need healing, 
desperately. He said, there's an SOS number that I have, and they ring me. I'll pray for them. He said, I've seen people with enlarged heads. He said, the heads have shrunk. He said, I've seen cripples walk. And he's got, now he's got this amazing, what I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. If you don't kill the giants in your life, you'll never go to the God's destiny. And that day, that giant that rose in front of him, as he, as he saw that man in a wheelchair, he thought, I can either just ignore it or do something about it. And so he grabbed him, pulled him out, and, and, he, and he started to, to, you know, this guy walked three steps. But as he did that, God is watching. And God says, I found myself a man. I found myself a people. I found somebody that's going to do something. Friend, we've, we've, the world system's got around us too much. We've got to break through. We've got to, we've got to smash those things down. David had to fight the negativity that surrounded his life. His brothers said, who's looking after those few sheep of yours? I know you're who you are and everything like that. But David said, hey, is there not a cause? Then he went up to Saul and he said, I'll fight him. And what did Saul say to him? You can't fight him. You're nothing but a boy. And he is a, a man of war from his youth. You can't fight him. And David had to rise again. Friend, we've got to push back and shoot, kill all those giants. There was more than one giant that day that David had to fight. He had to fight that major giant out there, yes, but he also had to fight the unbelief in the armies that he was serving in. I, he said, I killed a lion and a bear and, and this, and he identified the problem. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, hallelujah, because my God is going to do it. My God will do it. Is there not a cause? Is there not something that will cause you to rise up? In 1 Samuel 17, verse 33, it, it's just amazing verses of Scripture. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go out against him. But he said, I, I will fight him. And he said, I killed this and I struck it and I delivered it. And I, and I killed both lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied uh, the army of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to him, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then, then Saul tried to get David to do it the worldly way, with his own, with his own stuff. We know there that, that he fought that off, and he said he took it off. It says here, Verse 40, it says, Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. They put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had in his sling in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came drawing near uh, to David. And the man who, wore his sh who bore his shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, disdained him. He was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said, David, said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and God the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and I will take your head from you. This day I will give the carcass, give, give the carcass, carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. And the, all, all the earth shall know that there is a God in Israel. Devil, I know where you are. I don't know where you are, but I know you can hear me. You have played with my mind and you have played, had your way long enough. No more. You are done. I believe that this woman from the war room, it's like David, 
And if we can start to catch something, that when the enemy comes, we're just going to lay down and play dead. We're not going to be like the fainting goats. But we're going to rise up with a voice. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Devil, I don't know where you are, but I know you can hear me. You have played with my mind and you've had your way long enough. No more. You are done. Jesus is the Lord of this house. And that means there is no place for you anymore. Now take your lies, your shame and your accusations and I will rise above the shame and I will rise above the fear and I will rise above everything that comes that you throw at me and get out in Jesus' name. You can't have my marriage, my daughter, my man. This house, my life is under new management. That means you are out. And another thing, I'm sick of you stealing my joy. And that has changed too. My joy doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from this or that. My joy is found in Jesus. And in case you have forgotten... Jesus has already defeated you. Now go back to hell where you belong and leave me alone. The God, the God, my God will deliver you into my hands. My God will amazingly deliver you into my hand. And the Bible tells us the story how David took that stone and he ran towards the armies of the Philistines. He ran towards that Goliath and he put that little stone in that pouch and he began to sling it around his head. And that Goliath there with all his roaring and all his raging and it says that David let that go. It wasn't, it was the Holy Spirit. Friend, I want to tell you everything that happens in our lives has got to come out of an anointing, out of a relationship with God. And this stone entered that enemy's head and, it, and, he, and he fell to the floor and it says that David ran over and put his foot on his chest. He took his sword from his side and pulled it out of the Goliath's side because David didn't even have a sword and chopped off his head. But one of the interesting things that I read is that David put his, the armor of the Goliath in his tent. Then he went up to see Saul. King Saul. But you know what he had in his hand? Goliath's head. Goliath's head. And can you believe that? I got so excited when I heard that. I got so happy. I thought, good on you, David. Good on you, David. He walks up to that man that was supposed to be leader of that nation, dragging that old head, walked right on him. <laughs> that might be a giant you've got to defeat. Bring it on. <laughs> I've automatically rolled up my sleeve there. <laughs> It's not a time to be dismayed and fearful. It's not a time to hide in our tents and our caves. It's a time to stand up and know the battle's not ours, it's the Lord's. Amen? God is fighting for us. Father, I just ask you today that we, your church, Oh, God, we would just want a relationship with you. We would just want you, God. 
We would just want you come into a relationship. Come into your presence. Fight the Goliaths. Pull somebody out of a wheelchair. Do something. Don't hide. Don't run. Don't become a slave to fear. I will rise. I will rise. I will rise above the shame. I will rise above the fear. I will rise. I will rise. If you're in this house today and, and you know that in, inside perhaps, and I'm going to say it this way, but it might be even too strong, but but inside it's like a, a defeated thing where, where you, you're held down and, and you, you can't speak and you can't share and you can't do things. But God wants you to rise above it. He wants you to break it because really, friend, you become a slave to it. You become a slave to whatever it is. And I will rise above it. Just right now, Give me a wave if you say, Neil, I need to rise above some stuff. Come on. Come on. Come on. Be honest. Be real. Be truthful. I've become a slave to something.